In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, let's take a moment to recollect ourselves in the presence of Almighty God and invite the Holy Spirit to open our hearts and minds. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady, Seat of Wisdom, pray for us. St. Jerome, pray for us. St. Luke, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So I want to start with just a little joke, uh, just a little bit of humor that we can draw from. Uh, Luke chapter 1 here. Uh, you know, just think of Zechariah and Elizabeth been married all these years and they know each other. They can read each other's thoughts before they even think them. Okay, so old married couple here. And uh, here's the Blessed Mother and uh, she comes in, the one who believed. So when I hear this word leading into today's subject matter, which is going to be the Magnificat, but leading into it is this verse of Elizabeth where she says in exultation, blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. And then Mary launches into her Magnificat. So anyway, my point here is Zechariah is presumably standing there and he can neither speak nor hear. So he doesn't hear what she said, presumably. He's co-false, deaf and dumb. Uh, but I just wonder, at the very least, maybe Elizabeth might have been at least tempted to give a little glance over at her husband when she said that, blessed is she who believed what was spoken to her would be fulfilled, glancing over at him and then giving a little wink to the Blessed Mother. Uh, just a little humor there, probably didn't happen, but funny to think about, okay, knowing human nature. And let's get into this Magnificat, which means magnifies, all right? magnifies the blessed mother magnifies god she gives she gives greater glory to almighty god she is his masterpiece all right um god taking us to his gallery uh to show off all the work of grace okay all his saving work is on display in his gallery his saints and in a very special way, his masterpiece, the Mona Lisa, the Blessed Mother. So he's watching us, taking us on a tour through his gallery. And he's hearing us ooh and ah at all his works. Uh, but then when he gets to the Blessed Mother, he's so eager. He can't wait for us to come into this room. Uh, let me show you my uh, favorite work. And everybody is like just, oh, oh. oh. And uh, he's standing behind the crowd of people ooing and eyeing with tremendous gratification and satisfaction. Okay, why? Because it all redounds, all their oohs and ahs redound to him, who is the painter, the potter, the master craftsman. She is the finished work of his grace from start to finish. She is his savior. She was saved by grace. She is a work of the grace of God. All right, from start to to finish, uh, it's the same for all of us. We are saved by grace, right? And when we get to heaven, rather than detract from the glory of God, our own glory is reflected glory. It reflects like the moon. Like the moon is the great image of the church that the fathers of the church in the early centuries would always refer to the church as the moon, Okay, which doesn't generate any light of its own. It just bears the reflection of the sun, but it is a luminary. Okay, it's luminous with the light of the sun. So will all the saints be and the Blessed Virgin Mary in a very special way. All her virtues outshine all the saints put together. Okay, the Blessed Virgin Mary and <clears throat> her holiness is unimaginably holy. It's so awesome. And it redounds to God's glory. It magnifies the glory of God. Rather than Martin Luther's approach, which is that we're just piles of dung, excrement, and we're covered by the grace of Christ, and that's how we get into heaven. All right, look, that is not the Catholic understanding. 
of an imputed external righteousness which just covers us and we remain a turd for all eternity. Okay? Now that is not uh, the Catholic understanding it is infused grace, that it gets into that excrement. I don't like that image, but that's what Martin Luther used, so I'll go with it for now, but it's not perfect image. All right? We're wounded, deeply wounded, deeply wounded by sin. But the grace of God is infused, poured into us, and sanctifies us from within. Rather than somehow aggrandize ourselves, it's the work of God's grace from start to finish. All right, but the Blessed Virgin Mary, she just never fell in the ditch. There's a couple different ways God can save somebody, okay? He can rescue them from the ditch when they've fallen in, but he can also prevent them from falling into the ditch in the first place, which is the sense of salvation of the Blessed Mother when she says, refers to God as my Savior. Absolutely, a Catholic would say, yes, absolutely. God saved her, but he saved her in a unique fashion by not letting her fall in. You saved my life. You can say that in either sense, pulling us out of the ditch or preventing us from falling in. Now, uh, the Blessed Mother, I said last time, was like the Ark of the Covenant, and I just wanted to point out that look at the masterpiece behind me there, that statue of the Blessed Virgin Mary. I just wanted to reinforce that point about the Ark of the Covenant and how it's dressed up. How is it clothed? In the Old Testament, I read for you and described how the Ark of the Covenant is overlaid with gold, and then it is covered with a blue vesture, a blue garment or blue cloth is uh, spread out over top of the whole thing. All right, isn't that interesting? Blue and gold. The Ark of the Covenant, blue and gold. What is our Blessed Mother? And this very statue behind me dressed in blue and gold. We associate these colors with the Blessed Mother and it's deeply biblical when you consider she is the true Ark of the Covenant far surpassing that Old Testament box. All right, now... Um, Mary magnifies. She's the work of grace. Did she ever become proud? No. The Blessed Mother never became proud about it. You imagine if any of, any of us was given this supreme honor bestowed on every, any human being for all time uh, or any angel, okay? This is a very special creature here, folks, given a special uh, honor by becoming the mother of God and therefore the queen mother, okay, of the son of God, not just any earthly king, but a divine king, okay. She becomes his mother, therefore she is royalty. She is majesty. She is the queen of heaven and earth. Uh, she's the queen of angels, queen of saints, queen of martyrs, queen of confessors, queen, 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 okay. She is the great queen because she is the mother of the king. Right? This is the moment of salvation history, of, indeed, of the history of the entire human race, God's entrance into this world, the king. Under these lowly circumstances, this virgin from Nazareth was given an unimaginable dignity and honor. Unimaginable. Did it make her proud? No. Not in the slightest degree. She magnifies the Lord with her spirit. She does not have the slightest bit of ego about it. Imagine if we did, though, if we were given that honor. Hmm. Wow, God chose me. All the people that ever lived, currently living, or will ever live, I was chosen. Wow, I must be pretty special. Wow, pat myself on the back to beat the band. Bum, bum, ba -dum, bum, 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 bum. Ow. All right, now, folks, she's not proud about it. And uh, the themes that we hear about in the Magnificat of God bringing down what is exalted and raising up what is lowly uh, is really paralleled by this great song of Hannah. Okay, in chapter 2 of 1 Samuel, she be becomes the mother of Samuel. Okay, and <clears throat> she makes this prayer. Uh, asking, begging God to bless her with a child because she has been barren. And she promises to dedicate this child to the Lord. So if she is uh, allowed to conceive by Almighty God, and God hears her prayer, right? 
But uh, I want to read in its entirety this prayer of Hannah, because as we go through the Magnificat, we're going to be like, wow, sounds exactly like Hannah's prayer here. Chapter 2, verses 1 to 10 of 1 Samuel. It's an incredibly beautiful prayer. It's worth reading in its entirety. Hannah also prayed and said, My heart exalts in the Lord. My strength is exalted in the Lord. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in my salvation. Excuse me. I rejoice in thy salvation. There is none holy like the Lord. There is none besides thee. There is no rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble gird on strength. Those who are full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who are hungry have ceased to hunger. The barren has borne seven, but, also, but she has... Many, but she who has many children is forlorn. The Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low, he also exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and on them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness. For not by might shall a man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Against them he will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the power of his anointed. What's that all about? There is no Davidic dynasty yet. The very first king is going to be Saul, who's going to be anointed by the son that she hasn't even had yet, Samuel, okay? is going to anoint the very first king when the people clamor for a king. This uh, man of the tribe of Benjamin uh, is chosen, Saul. And it doesn't work out so good. So he's replaced by David of the tribe of Judah. And <clears throat> such begins the Davidic dynasty, which is going to last for quite a long time. And he is going to be known as this anointed one, okay? Uh, we call any son of David an anointed one. Uh, Samuel is going to do the anointing uh, with the oil. They're going to be anointed king, and hence an anointed one. But here is a reference to a king by Hannah at the end. He will give strength to his king and exalt the power of his anointed. Now, this hasn't even occurred yet. Is this a prophecy under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit? Sure sounds like it to me. Very interesting. It's the first reference to an anointed one that we have uh, here in 1 Samuel. I don't believe there's another one before this. All right. Uh, this is the very first. A reference of a Messiah. Okay. Before 2 Samuel 7 coming up uh, when the prophet Nathan is going to tell David, or the Lord's going to tell David through the prophet Nathan, that there's going to be a son of his, an anointed one who's going to come, uh, who's going to have an eternal throne, and whom God is going to refer to as his son. So there's this very mysterious character that later becomes known as one like a son of man in Daniel, or the suffering servant of Isaiah. Uh, very, very interesting. The branch, okay, the netzer that's going to spring from the stump of the tree of David chopped down, the tree of Jesse. His father, okay, the Davidic dynasty is going to be chopped down and there's going to be a little sprig, a little branch, a little netzer. And uh, as a result of the yes of this, this virgin from Nazareth here is, uh, is going to bring about this little shoot that's going to come out. All right. Uh, very, very mysterious. In Genesis chapter 49, Jacob's on his deathbed and he's blessing his, his sons and he gets to Judah and he says, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until he comes to whom it belongs. And to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. 
all the peoples, all the nations, the Gentiles, okay, are going to obey this one whom the scepter comes to. Um, very, very interesting. It's a singular. Until he comes to whom it belongs. Who is this mysterious individual, this he? Uh, perhaps it's the seed of the woman, all right? You put, pull a thread through all these dots and pull all these dots in line. I'm telling you, there's incredible symmetry here. The Natsur, the son, one like a son of man, or also in Daniel, you have the dream of Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 2. And you have that little stone that uh, Daniel interprets for him. How this massive statue, which is uh, supposed to symbolize all four of these these Gentile nations or empires or kingdoms that are going to arise and with Rome being the last one with clay feet, okay, mixed with iron. And this little stone not cut by human hands is going to strike those feet and bring the whole thing toppling down and it's going to turn to dust. Okay, the nations are nothing but dust in the eyes of Almighty God, less than dust, okay. And that little stone has just been conceived in the womb of the Blessed Mother. Something so enormous is happening right now that has implications for the Blessed Mother. Uh, the one who was referred to by Jacob, who the scepter was going to come to and who will receive the obedience of the nations. I obey him and I'm part of the nations. I'm not Jewish. Okay, so I'm a... We are all literally fulfillments of that prophecy of Jacob in Genesis 49. Okay, that little stone has brought about this, uh, this conquest, okay, of the empires of the world and converted Rome in the end. The Roman emperor in a few centuries became a disciple of the carpenter from Nazareth. The little stone, the little shoot. Okay, and remember that stone, after it strikes that statue in Daniel 2, okay, it's going to become a great mountain and fill the whole earth. Uh, it's the church. Uh, all these things, we can go on and on, folks, but that's the backdrop of this moment of salvation history to just zoom in on it. This is what God has been preparing for, for so long, this Lamb of God to come into this world to save us from our sins. This new Moses, that Moses said in Deuteronomy 18 would come, okay, a new Moses and bring about a new exodus. All right, so uh, now this beginning of um, the Magnificat, let's just, before we actually get into it, make a general point that if you like opera, this is kind of like an operatic piece that is referred to as an operatic aria. I think that means breath. It's basically um, a moment to absorb the importance of what's taking place. So it's like a uh, moment of pause. You hit the pause button and you insert a song because the import of this moment is such that it is fitting and appropriate that we pause and honor the moment. Uh, the gravitas, extreme gravitas of this moment, okay, in salvation history, warrants a special prayer or song of exaltation. This canticle of the Blessed Mother we call the Magnificat, all right? So it's like an, it's, I don't watch opera, but this is just what I read, that it's likened to an operatic aria. I like that. And of course, there's going to be four of them in the infancy narratives. Simeon and Anna and Zechariah's Benedict Deuce we'll deal with next time. And now today, the Blessed Mother's Magnificat, four of them. These moments of pause, these little songs inserted in, prayer songs. Now, uh, I can relate to this in one sense. You know, it's something in the, tomorrow I'll be doing a wedding. I got the rehearsal tonight. And uh, one thing I always recommend to couples is that they have an Ave Maria sung after the vows and exchange of rings. Because in the order of the ritual, the wedding ritual, the next thing to come after the exchange of vows is the prayers of the faithful, prayers of petition. To me, I mean, this incredibly momentous thing just occurred. And they are now a married couple. 
once they exchange their vows. It's so solemn. The gravitas of that moment is so profound, sublime, that I'm uh, feeling so awkward as the celebrant after they just exchange vows and rings in front of everybody. And then, according to the ritual, what do I do? I just invite the bridal party to take their seats. I invite the bride and groom to retake their seats. And uh, then I go and call everyone to stand and let us pray for the needs of the church and the world. To me, it deserves a moment of pause to absorb the import of what just happened. And I think the couple, too, to try to absorb it somehow. And uh, so what I always recommend is an Ave Maria be sung at that time, and they go over to the statue of the Blessed Virgin Mary, kneel down and pray at that time. So I usually like to have roses or some flowers on the table there prepared uh, by the altar that uh, the bride and groom take over to the statue and kneel down and pray. All right, so anyway, that to me is uh, how I relate to this operatic area. So it's two strophes, uh, two strophes, two parts, basically, of uh, the Magnificat. Uh, the first is verses 46 to 50, which is she's talking about what God has done for her. Uh, he's looked upon her lowliness of, of that she is the handmaid of the Lord. He's looked upon her lowliness and showed mercy. Okay, so it's about what God has done for her, 46 to 50, but then 51 to 55 is what God has done for Israel. Israel, his servant, uh, that he's lifted up and shown mercy to. So if there's an overarching theme, it's mercy, okay, and humility. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, it's kind of two different parts. Now, synonymous and antithetical parallelisms. So uh, that's very common, very, very, very biblical, okay? in a Hebrew way of thinking, praying, writing, poetic uh, style, okay, is uh, to say things twice, doublets, okay? And, uh, or you say, you know, so they're synonymous where you're basically saying the same thing twice, uh, but then you're also sometimes saying opposite things, okay, in a parallel fashion. So it's kind of neat. Synth uh, synonymous and antithetical parallelisms. My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. All right. Uh, he has shown, sh that's an example of synonymous parallelism. Okay, obviously. My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. But then here's an example of antithetical parallelism. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. Kind of parallel, but uh, kind of antithesis of one another. All right, now, it's full of so many scriptural allusions, so rich with scripture. The Blessed Mother truly fulfills uh, the words in Colossians of St. Paul when he says... Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. The Blessed Mother was so full of the word of God. Before she ever conceived the word of God, capital W, she had the word of God constantly resonating, percolating around in her mind. Okay, she was full of it. Now, that we don't know for sure what the Blessed Mother's childlike was. What was her education in the Jewish faith? Uh, speculation on our part. But it isn't totally without ground, all right? Yeah, we got, we got to look at apocryphal literature, okay? So we look at the second century pseudo, hold on, uh, proto-euangelion, the first gospel of James, all right? Is this uh, apocryphal work which contains some inaccuracies and errors. It's not considered part of the canon at all, um, and I'm sure it's got issues. Uh, but that is where we derive the names of Mary's parents, which are not recorded in the New Testament, Anna and Joachim. So it's taken up into the tradition. And it describes that and this uh, seventh century, we think, uh, pseudo-gospel of Matthew. 
Is that right? And, uh, and it, uh, these two sources give us some clues from, you know, again, just from a kind of a, a tradition uh, that uh, the Blessed Mother was in the temple for 10 years, that she was dedicated to the Lord by her parents and spent 10 years in the temple before she was married to Joseph, who is described as an older man who's widowed and has kids, right? And is agrees, agrees to marry her because as we heard in Numbers 30, all right, there's this precedent for women taking vows and they have to be honored by their husband uh, if they enter into a marriage. Uh, it has to be with the agreement of the spouse that he will honor this vow and presumably this vow is virginity. Okay, for the sake of the Lord. All right, so the Blessed Mother has dedicated herself to the Lord. That is what's behind that statement. I do not know man. How can this be since I do not know man? All right, uh, she's about to be, she's about to consummate her marriage with Joseph. She wouldn't ask that question of the angel if she knows her birds and the bees unless uh, she has taken a vow. It's the only way to really make sense of that mysterious question of the Blessed Virgin Mary. All right? Numbers chapter 30, you read that and you'll see there, uh, the Blessed Mother, uh, we have good grounds to believe that she had been dedicated to the Lord, educated in the temple, all right? and had made a promise, a vow of celibacy uh, to be set apart for the Lord. But then she was married to Joseph under this agreement uh, that uh, this is a guy who's willing to marry her, he's older, and not so much concerned about conjugal relations anymore, all right? And um, which explains why Joseph wasn't around when Jesus died on the cross and entrusted his, his uh, mother to the apostle John because Joseph was no longer with us. A lot of this is just based on tradition. Uh, we don't know for sure. It's not drawn from scripture, but there it is. All right, now, she's absolutely full of the word of God. And <clears throat> now, megaluno, I want to point out this word megaluno. Uh, basically, my soul magnifies the Lord. Magnifies, megaluno. Um, is interesting to pause on that word to exalt something, hold something up, hold it out as great. All right, and uh, hopefully it's not us; it's God. Okay, so the same word is used by the Pharisees, or is used of the Pharisees by our Lord when He's lambasting them in Matthew's Gospel, chapter twenty-three when he pronounces the seven woes upon the Pharisees and lambastes them for making their tassels, uh, magnifying their tassels, megaluno, uh, which ultimately is just calling attention to themselves. The Blessed Mother doesn't do that, nor does St. Paul here in Philippians 1.20. Let's just hear from St. Paul. It's kind of beautiful what he says. Using the very same word, he says, Yes, and I shall rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I shall not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body. Megaluno honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Here's a guy in captivity writing to the Philippians in Rome, house arrest, and who's facing down his own execution. Right? And he wants to do this to glorify Megaluno, magnify the Lord, not himself, in his very body. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. That same spirit of a saint, same spirit we see in the Blessed Virgin Mary in the most exemplar manner, 
imaginable uh, is, uh, yeah, on full display here, Her Holiness magnifies the Lord like the moon, okay? Uh, the moon ultimately, it draws its light, luminosity from the sun. Now, uh, next Greek word, I, uh, I'm not going to hit you with too many Greek words right now, but I was skimming through trying to see if there was any, anything interesting to be gained. And yeah, the next word I want to introduce to you is agi, hold on, agaleo, agaleo, or agaleao. Okay, but anyway, it means to leap with joy, okay? Literally, you're jumping for joy. And this is the word the Blessed Virgin Mary uses here when she said, my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. And this is a real powerful use of the word joy. All right. And this is the gospel of joy, as I mentioned before. I went back and looked up various words used for joy. Kara, caris, uh, sukaria, all these different words to rejoice with. Uh, to rejoice, rejoicing, um, exaltation, celebration, making merry, all these uh, uses of this word, and exuberation, all right? And guess what? 31 uses of joy in Luke's gospel. It's full of joy. As I said, it's a gospel of joy. And this word here, the Blessed Mother, is a very unique word. It's hardly ever used in the New Testament. I think I wrote down here, Agalio. I don't even think it's used anywhere else except in Luke's Gospel, chapter 10, when it describes our Lord. I'm pretty sure these are the only two uses of this word. i got to double-check that, but that's what I think I remember. Um, in the whole of the New Testament, the blessed Mother Agaliaos, okay, jumps for joy. And our Lord himself in chapter 10, I think I told you last time, he rejoiced in the Holy Spirit at the return of the apostles and the 70 that he had sent out when he sees them, he, in that same hour, rejoiced in the Holy Spirit. Powerful, powerful word. A uh, neat thing to notice here now next. Uh, oh yeah, that word is in, used in the Old Testament Septuagint translation in one interesting place. And I found a few different places where it was, where it appeared, but one I want to notice in Habakkuk, because Habakkuk, you know, is basically complaining. That's how it begins. Like, he's mad. How long, how long, how long shall I cry? You will not hear, blah, blah, blah. And he's looking, see, you're, you're letting them get away with murder. And um, this is not fair. And he's, you know, um, he's wagging the finger at God. And, um, you know, really, come on, get on the stick, get on the ball here, God. Uh, and now uh, at the end, though, changes his tune. Chapter 3, verses 17 to 19. Listen to what he says. He has a complete turnaround after he sees kind of a vision of God's plan of redemption and how awesome and intricate and elegant it really is and how fair it truly is in the end, right? And how awesome and spectacular it is. Then he has this conversion and he... he finds his balance again, his center in trust of Almighty God and his plans. And he's in a tremendous place of spiritual maturity by the end of this writing, the prophet Habakkuk. He says, he says, I don't care. I don't even care. The Babylonians are coming. Let them have at it, you know. Let them do their worst, all right. Go ahead, run through our land, tear all the trees out of the ground, whatever you want to do, all right. Deport us. Uh, you can't touch us. It's like St. Paul, nothing... Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Uh, no one. If God are, is on our side, who is against us? If God is for us, who is against us? All right. And that's the kind of place of trust Habakkuk is in now. He says, though the fig tree do not blossom nor fruit beyond the vines, the produce of the olive fail and the, ye the fields yield no food. The flock be cut off from the fold and there be no herd in the stalls. Take away all my creaturely comforts all the things of this world that I rely upon for my safety and security and stability of my life. Take them all away. Yet, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. Very same word. Agalaio. Uh-oh. Say it different every time. 
but jumping for joy. I will jump for joy. Man, that sounds very Pauline. Rejoice always. Again, I say rejoice. Uh, God, the Lord is my strength. Last verse. He makes my feet like hinds feet. He makes me tread upon my high places. God, the Lord is my strength. The Blessed Mother echoes so many themes in salvation history. Uh, so many of the words of Scripture are taken up into the Magnificat. It is replete with allusions and downright words and phrases and snatches of this and that taken from sacred Scripture. We're going to look at some of them. Uh, but, wow. Wow. Uh, there's one of them right there, Habakkuk. I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. All right now, where am I? Let's talk about how she refers to God as her Savior. I think I started to talk about that already. But yes, absolutely. Uh, the Protestants want to say, see, Mary fell in the ditch. She's a sinner just like the rest of us. And that's why she calls God her Savior. They have a very narrow sense of salvation. Uh, that's, boy, is that true. Um, I could go on and on and on about that one, uh, but I won't for now. Um, narrow and reductionistic. There's different senses in which one can be saved, and this is a, a different sense entirely from those of us who have fallen into the ditch, all right? Uh, the children of Adam who are fallen, okay? Yes, she is a daughter of Eve, but she herself, from the moment of her conception, was prevented from falling into the ditch. God did it, though. It is the work of his grace that she was immaculately conceived. God prevented her, and in doing so, saved her, absolutely saved her. It's a work of God's grace, period, so that she would have this special role as this untarnished, unblemished, spotless, incorruptible Ark of the Covenant. All right. That's who she is, and that's God's special role for her. She is unique in salvation history. Now, um, and I thought, let me just read from Jude, because he says something similar in calling God his Savior. So let's read verses 24 and 25 of the letter of Jude the Apostle. At the very end, he says, Now to him who is able to keep you from falling... And to present you without blemish before the presence of his glory with rejoicing. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. All right, notice. Keep you from falling. All right. Uh, he kept the blessed mother from falling. And interesting, the word keep is shamar. Shamar in Greek, okay. Uh, literally, the word... Fulaso in Greek translates the, uh, when you go back to the garden, okay, chapter 2 of Genesis, when Adam is um, instructed by God to, um, to keep the garden, okay? The word in Hebrew is shamar, which also has a connotation of guard, okay? And uh, it's translated by this Greek word fulaso, all right, to keep something, to guard it. And that's exactly the word used here by Jude in verse 24. Now to him who is able to keep you from falling. In other words, there's something Eden about this uh, connotation of Eden here, perhaps. When you think of the Blessed Mother, her garden, she was able to keep this garden. She did not fall prey to the deception of the evil one, of the serpent who beguiled the first Eve, but this blessed mother, this new Eve, was not going to be beguiled. And um, Second Corinthians here, St. Paul is so worried that we will be beguiled. He says in Second Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, I feel a divine jealousy for you, for I betrothed you to Christ to present you as a pure bride to her one husband. But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his coming, cunning, your thoughts will be led astray by a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. All right? The Blessed Mother did not, uh, she was preserved inviolate from that deception of the evil one. All right? God kept this garden and she is like a sealed fountain, uh, like a garden 
a garden of the Lord, to use the imagery of the Song of Songs. Um, <clears throat> she is like a vineyard. My vineyard, my very own, is for myself. Uh, she is God's special vineyard uh, that's just for himself. If Solomon be kind of a, a type of Christ in this um, famous work of the Song of Songs, she is this one, very special one, a sealed fountain. And there's a wall around this garden. A garden locked is my sister, my bride. A garden locked. This is chapter 4, verse 12 of the Song of Songs. A garden locked is my sister, my bride. A garden locked. A fountain sealed. The Blessed Mother. Holy above all in the sense that holiness is being set apart for God. She was set apart for God in a very special way to be his sacred vessel or container. Uh, for God to come make his entrance into this world. So now, um, let's move on how she is the handmaid of the Lord. This is very beautiful. So I think uh, last time I was talking about, you know, how she got up, she hustled. She had a little hustle. You know, love's always a little bit in a hurry, you know. Mary arose uh, and went in haste uh, to Elizabeth to attend to Elizabeth. Um, she is the handmaid here. Uh, behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. Let it be done to you according. Let it be done to me according to your will. All right, uh, that's the work of God's grace, cooperating with her freedom. Okay, not compromising it or canceling it out, but actually fulfilling and completing it and perfecting her freedom, the grace of God. All right, when she said yes, there's a real synergy and cooperation there. It's just that. Uh, it's the work of God's grace, ultimately, from start to finish. But uh, her freedom still remains intact, as it does in all of us when we cooperate with the grace of God. All right, now, um, that's a very mysterious thing, but that's the Catholic understanding of how grace operates. Um, Protestants don't quite know what to do with that free will business, because they're afraid of attributing any work or any synergy or cooperation uh, between us and God. It has to be the work of God. So. Where does free will fit into all this? Luther had to throw it out. Luther and Calvin, they can't deal with it. Uh, but no, that doesn't make any sense in the larger context of the entirety of sacred scripture and God's plan of salvation. Okay, the total depravity of man and cancellation of our free will doesn't make any sense. Yes, we're conflicted and we struggle with concupiscence. Okay, um, and we're deeply wounded. But are we depraved and therefore don't have any freedom? That is not the Catholic understanding, all right? So she is the handmaid, okay? She is hand, his handmaid. She's handmade, as all of us are, literally. God made us, manufactured us with his hands, you know, in a certain sense. In that garden, when he got down on his hands and knees and fashioned us out of the, out of the mud, um, he's our manufacturer. Um, but we are his handmaids in a double sense there, I guess. Is that what you call a double entendre? Now, um, Psalm 123 is just something I think is beautiful in the context of this idea, this idea of being God's handmaid. I think it's worth reading. Psalm 123 is short. It's only four verses. To thee I lift up my eyes, O thou who art enthroned in the heavens. Behold, as the eyes of servants look to the hand of their master, as the eyes of a maid to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God till he have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon us, O Lord, have mercy upon us, for we have had more than enough of contempt. Too long our soul has been sated with the scorn of those who are at ease, the contempt of the proud. Wow, humility and being the handmaid, attending to the Lord and appealing to his mercy. All these themes, you know, are just absolutely filled to the brim in the Magnificat of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Uh, it's awesome. Now, um, blessed, I think we already talked about that quite a bit. You know, um, but... Uh, 
you know, blessed are you who believed and so on. Uh, but, you know, the Blessed Mother, she says here in the Magnificat that all generations shall call me blessed. And we call her to this day. It was a prophetic statement on the part of the Blessed Mother. It's like a prophecy. And it's come true as uh, she's known as the Blessed Mother. One of the most ignorant things I hear people say, I cannot stand it. Usually ignorant people or uh, irreverent scoffers refer to the BVM, the Blessed Virgin Mary, as the BVM. Heard a guy say that in a bank one time for all to hear. Oh yeah, I know all about that. I was raised Catholic. I know all about the BVM. In front of all these people in line, I just couldn't believe it. I felt bad for them, to tell you the truth. Uh, that was many years ago, but it's stuck in my memory. Uh, just somebody who's lost their faith, you know, in the realities behind these things that they were taught as mere doctrines and stories and stuff, but uh, they never really appropriated it, interiorized it, assimilated it. It's not something real to them uh, as it should be, a lively sense of the content of these things that we believe that they are not in contact with the realities behind these things. That's a real woman who's in heaven. Um, <clears throat> The Virgin from Nazareth. Don't refer to her as the BVM. Um, now, she is blessed, and I wanted to draw your attention one more time to Psalm 45, verse 17, because it's just really cool, prophetic here, you know. The first half of Psalm 45 is talking about the King, the Messiah, okay, whose throne endures forever, a royal scepter, okay, and um, anointed with the oil of gladness. And then you hear in the second half about this, this bride, this princess, this queen in gold of Ophir at the right hand of the king. And she's described very beautifully there how she's dressed and the whole scene is depicted for us with all her virgin companions in escort. And with joy and gladness they enter the palace of the king. Sounds like a picture of the book of Revelation in the end time. And the Blessed Mother is undoubtedly a model or image of the church and what we will be. Okay, so very, very eschatological in one sense. I would say the Psalm, Psalm 45, this royal messianic Psalm. And notice what it says in verse 17 at the end, when it's talking about the queen now, it's talking about the queen. I will cause your name to be celebrated or praised in all generations. Therefore, the peoples will praise you forever and ever. That's the Blessed Virgin Mary, folks. For my name is Larry Young. Now, might with his arm. Let's talk about the arm, the strong arm of God. This is a great theme. And uh, when she says, let me get back to Luke 1 here. When she says, the first thing, he has scattered the proud, the imagination of their hearts. He has shown strength with his arm, the arm of God. Awesome thing to contemplate. God's triceps, biceps, anterior, rear deltoids, side de frontal deltoids. Uh, his, uh, sorry, I don't know. I'm, I've exhausted my knowledge of, um, uh, what's the word for arm? Brachial, brachial, uh, musculature but um but anyway if you're a bodybuilder trying to build a sculpted arm okay and you're working on all these little muscle groups uh wow can you imagine the arm of god to imagine the arm of the lord the symbol of strength the right arm and the arm of the lord is described all throughout the scriptures uh in exodus we have to go back to exodus here uh you hear about the strong arm of God. The Lord is a man of war. Terror and dread fall upon them, you know, all these surrounding nations. They're going to melt away. Because of the greatness of thy arm. The arm of the Lord. Now let's go to Isaiah, who really grabs this theme. This is big in the prophet Isaiah. Uh, 
the arm of the Lord, my victorious right hand. Um, what are some other good examples here? Uh, the arm of the Lord. Um, Yeah, 40 verse 10. Behold, the Lord God comes with his might and his arm rules for him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms, carry them in his bosom. All right, but his strong arm, that is the Lord, folks. This is a prophetic a way of um, describing the Messiah. All right. He is the, high, the arm of the Lord, the right arm of the Lord. His right hand man. Son of man at his right hand in glory. Chapter 52, verse 10. Look at 52, 10. More about this arm. 52, 10. Oh, this is a good one. The Lord has bared his holy arm. Okay, now we're in a bodybuilding contest here. The Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Isn't that ironic when you think this is What's about to come? Uh, this is literally right before the famous uh, chapter 53. It actually begins at the end of chapter 52, right before this statement about God bearing his arm, flexing his muscles before all the nations, okay? Uh, and then what is he, what? It's so, it's so counterintuitive to human thinking. What comes after that about this? Third, or excuse me, fourth suffering servant song of uh, this suffering servant who is uh, completely, he's gonna startle many nations, many nations because of his appearance. He's so marred beyond human semblance. This does not look like a very impressive um, and it's so interesting in verse 53, verse 1. Who has believed what we have heard and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? There's something mysterious about God's arm. Not everybody sees this strength, this musculature on God's arm. They don't see strength in weakness. My strength is made perfect in weakness. God tells St. Paul, the Lord tells him. Um, God loves weakness and the weak things of the earth. This little virgin from Nazareth is going to upset kings. She's going to give birth to a little stone. It's going to bring down this mighty statue of all these kingdoms of the earth. And the Lord is going to bear his holy arm, and this arm is the son, his son. That's just not me interpreting that. St. Jerome said that, interpreted it that way. It's the father flexing. <laughs> And the Catechism makes references to the Son and the Spirit as the two hands, or you could say arms of the Father. It's just an analogy. Every analogy limps, okay? But uh, the Catechism uses it a couple times, so it's probably drawn from our tradition. Fathers of the Church probably use that analogy. I'm not sure. Now, um, let's look at just a couple others. 59, 16 in Isaiah. More about the arm. Yeah, these are good. Um, the Lord saw it and it displeased him that there was no justice. But notice, you know, he can't get any help from us. He saw that there was no man, no one to uphold justice in the land, no one to help him. So again, we're, we're helpless, we're powerless. We can't pull ourselves out of the bog by our own hair. Okay, just pathetic. So God is going to have to do it like Genesis 15 and the, the dream of Abraham, of Abram and the animal parts and God walking through the animal parts. He's going to uphold both ends of the agreement. The story of Noah. Call that to mind. None of us is going to be able to save us, okay? It's going to take God's holy arm. Our arms are pitiful. I just hurt my arm a second ago by simply pretending to pat myself on the back. Ouch. All right. Um, 
He saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no one to intervene. Then his own arm brought him victory and his righteousness upheld him. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation upon his head. It's the description of the Messiah, okay, of God. His own arm. All right, one more and then we're done. Let's look at chapter 63, verse 5. This is so powerful here. This is the depiction of the passion of the Christ in chapter 63. Well, you know, why is it thy apparel is red? This fascinating dialogue. Um, why is thy apparel red and thy garments like his that treads in the wine press? Can't help but just have this picture of our Lord and his passion and death. And he says, he responds, suffering servant, Messiah, I have trodden the wine press alone. From the peoples, no one was with me. Then this pulls on your heartstrings. I trod them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath. I looked, but there was no one to help. I was appalled, but there was no one to uphold. So my own arm brought me victory. My own arm. I love it. Now, he has shown strength with his arm, folks. The arm of the Lord. Awesome. Let's go on to the next one here. In the imagination of their hearts is an interesting expression. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. Okay, the imagination of their, of their mind was like evil all the time before God destroyed everything at the flood, all right? Like similar, similar language. He saw that the imagination of man was, was evil, wicked all the time. And uh, yeah, the heart of every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually, all right? And then God wiped us out with the flood but it didn't solve the problem. So here they are in chapter 11 after the flood and Noah and that whole thing. And Noah and his sons land and they, their wives and they begin to have children again and the human race begins to spread again, these descendants of Noah. And then in the next very next chapter 11, they build the Tower of Babel where they are scattered by the Lord. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord scattered them. Okay. Ultimately, he's it's very similar to the words of the Blessed Mother here. He has shown strength with his holy with his arm, and he has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. Um, Humbled and exalted. I have so many examples of this. There are too many scriptural things to even touch upon all of them. Um, but this theme of being humbled and exalted. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of low degree. Uh, this reversal of human thinking, what is exalted among men is an abomination uh, of God. By, is, a, is held abominable by God, Luke 16, 15. All right. Uh, humbled and exalted. Let's just look at a few here. How about Ezekiel 21, 26? Let's look at a couple of things. This is interesting. This is another one of these mysterious passages referring to the Messiah. Remove the turban and take off the crown. This is during the exile here, okay? So Israel is being humbled. Remove the turban and take off the crown. Things shall not remain as they are. Exalt that which is low and abase that which is high. A ruin, ruin, ruin will make it, and there shall be not even a trace of it until he comes whose right it is, and to him I will give it. He's talking about this Babylonian captivity. The tree of Jesse is going to be chopped down. The Davidic dynasty is going to come to an end, God says through the prophet Ezekiel here. And the crown, take off the crown, take off the turban. All right, you won't even remember it. Ruin, ruin, ruin. That's an example of this 
Hebrew exclamation point, say something three times, holy, 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 or ruin, 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 all right? A ruin, 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 I will make it. There will not be even a trace of it until this very moment where we're at right now. Until he comes whose right it is, and to him I will give it. So after over 500 years, here's the one who has a right to the king, to the throne, uh, to the throne of David, and to the crown, all right? This descendant of David, the Messiah. Oh, awesome. All right, let's go to Genesis 49.10. We already did that. So let's go to Psalm 75. This is cool. Psalm 75 here. We give thanks to thee, O God. We give thanks. We call on thy name and recount thy wondrous deeds. At the, time, at the set time which I appoint, I will judge with equity when the earth totters and all its inhabitants. It is I who keep steady its pillars. I say to the boastful, do not boast. And to the wicked, do not lift up your horn. Do not lift up your horn on high or speak with insolent neck. Horn, symbol of power, exalting your power. Anyway, this is just a great uh, image here of... Um, God exalting the lowly and bringing down the proud who exalt their horn on high. And uh, I like this expression, speak with insolent neck. I don't know exactly what that means. I guess. Uh, I can picture Hitler on his platform in Nuremberg in front of a huge crowd. Insolent neck. All right, did I do a good job? Uh, no. Yeah, this lowly child's going to reign. I've said a lot of that already. Isaiah 2, 12 and 18. Yeah, let's look at a little more Isaiah 2, 12 and 18. 2, 12 through 18. And for the Lord of hosts has a day against all that is proud and lofty, against all that is lifted up and high. Against all the cedars of Lebanon, lofty and lifted up, and against all the oaks of Bashan. I'll skip down. And the haughtiness of man shall be humbled, and the pride of man shall be brought low, and the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. And the idols shall utterly pass away, which they do, of course. Idol worship virtually disappears from the Mediterranean world. Once Christianity, Christianity spreads and grows, they throw out their idols. They burn their magic books in the middle of Ephesus. Thousands and tens of thousands of dollars worth of magical books with spells and incantations. And they throw away their little idols to Demetrius and whatever. Uh, or not Demetrius, to uh, Diana. All right, now, um, almost done. Yeah, I already mentioned Daniel too, but since we're in Isaiah, we'll just mention more that adds to the import of this moment. Let's just mention once again in, De in Isaiah chapter 9, for us, to us a child is born, to us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulder and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end. He will sit on the throne of David and there will be no end. This is a description of the Messiah forevermore. He will reign in justice and righteousness. In verse chapter 11 here, we hear about this root from the stump of Jesse. I already mentioned this Netzer from Netzerith, branch down. A branch is going to spring forth from the yes of the Blessed Mother, from her fiat, this little branch, a little twig or a little branch shoot is going to come forth from this dead stump. And what's going to happen? The whole earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as waters cover the sea. In that day, the root of Jesse shall stand as an ensign to all the peoples. Him shall the nations seek, and his dwelling shall be made glorious. He will raise an ensign for the nations, the cross, an ensign for the nations, and will assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. All right. Um, so... I think we're, time is up. I'm a little over an hour. So I think what I'll do is, um, oh, there's more here. I got to finish this. There's more. Grace to the humble. 
I'll try to rip through this real quick here. Grace to the humble. In a, in a, you know, we've already talked about that somewhat. There's other scripture passages we could look at that just make that simple point. You know, uh, in the New and Old Testaments, Proverbs 3.34, James 4.6, 1 Peter 5, verses 5 and 6, all examples of how God is drawn or attracted to humility. Okay, when we humble ourselves, we draw the Lord uh, to us. Um, he gives grace to the humble. Humility is the foundation of all the virtues. I don't know what saint, but some saint was asked, what's the most important virtue? And they said, humility. Well, what's the second? Humility. And what's the third? Humility. Humility, humility, humility. Foundation. All right. So the rich, she uh, talks about the rich. The rich, he's going to send empty away. Hmm. The rich. Yeah, it makes me think of Luke chapter 12 and the guy who built the barns. All right. But he did not, he was not rich towards God. Right? He was a fool. He was counted a fool by Almighty God. Because uh, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And I'm going to say to my soul this, take your ease. Fool. So is a, anybody who's a fool who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. Uh, so anyway, basic theme in the scriptures there. Israel, my servant. Uh, Israel is called my servant. It's also, you know, the suffering servant. It's kind of both and and 40. Isaiah chapter 41, verses 8 to 10 is an example of how, you know, there's a double sense, polyvalence here to this idea of the servant, Israel, my servant, because she is referred to as the servant of the Lord. But then there's this individual that is also referred to in the suffering servant songs. It's not a collective term. It's an individual who suffers an individual destiny in great detail. Okay, it's not just a metaphor, it's about an individual who somehow takes up into himself, is how we understand it, the vocation of Israel. So yes, Israel was called to be a servant of the Lord. And our Lord fulfills that calling perfectly himself by becoming the servant of the Lord. So our, the Blessed Mother here refers, he has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, and to Abraham and to his posterity forever. When you hear, as soon as you hear that, Abraham and his spermity, uh, his, uh, his descendants, okay, his seed, okay, that's us. It's all people of faith. Think of Paul's whole argument in Romans and Galatians. He is the father of us all, all people of faith, okay? Um, Abraham, the father of faith, uh, the father of us all who have faith, Abraham. And God promised to him, in Genesis 12 and Genesis 22 and throughout the whole Abrahamic episode here, he says after he shows and demonstrates his faith by being willing to sacrifice his only son. And then God swears to him again, by myself I have sworn because you've done this. I will indeed bless you and I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. The gates will, of hell will not prevail against the church. We are the descendants of Abraham and we shall possess the gates of our enemies. That's an attack mode. All right. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. And by your descendants shall all the nations of the earth bless themselves because you have obeyed me. So when the Blessed Mother says that, clearly when she talks about to Abraham this promise of help in remembrance of his mercy, to Abraham and to his posterity forever, uh, she's talking about all of us. So anyway, I'm going to end with this final note here. Mary remained with her about three months. I already talked about that, how the Ark of the Covenant stayed in the house of Obed-Edom in 2 Samuel 6 for three months before David brought him to uh, Jerusalem, brought the ark to Jerusalem. Three months, the importance of that was already made mention of. But just notice, she returned to her home. In other words, not Joseph's home. Okay, so they're betrothed, but they are not living together yet. And they have not had conjugal relations yet. 
She returns to her own home at this stage. All right. Now, um, next time we'll run through a couple points sandwiched in between the Magnificat and the Benedictus or a couple few interesting things around the birth of St. John the Baptist. And then we'll start launching into uh, the Benedictus of Zechariah. Until next time, God bless you.